an era in which we are questioning the effectiveness of markets in producing the kind of society and economy we want to live in, it is more important than ever to have an objective debate about the role that markets and the state play in the economy. Is the state necessary only to correct market failures, or is it also needed to more actively shape and create markets and technological opportunities, and to promote growth which is not only smart, but also inclusive? The process of financialization, which has happened to the United States over the last 25 or 30 years, is not just about what the financial crisis of 2008 did to the American people. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, a, a long-term uh, destruction of the bargaining power of workers and of the actual availability of jobs in our society. Uh, in, throughout the last 25 years, the, the, the portion of the American people who have actually been in the workforce, who have actually been able to get jobs, uh, it has been lower throughout, in good times and bad, uh, than it was during the period after, after World War II when our economy was not dominated by finance in the way it is. At the same time, with essentially permanent mass unemployment, right, that means that workers don't have any bargaining power, isn't it? You can't bargain successfully with your employer if there are three people waiting outside your, 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 your place of work to take your job. Along with permanent low employment, or permanent unemployment, comes permanent wage stagnation. And for, the, and for the majority of Americans, if you look at wages not in, in by average, but by median, or if you look at the, the, the more typical American or the middle income American, it's actually falling wages, particularly falling wages in the last few years. Now, the, what makes this even worse and more serious is that the concentration of wealth that financialization brings, and in, in two forms. One is, just in the hands of individual people involved in finance, right? the hedge fund manager who, who, who earns $2 billion in a year, uh, that concentration of wealth brings with it political power. At the same time, there are even greater concentrations of wealth uh, in institutions in the financial system. So that an institution like uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, with more than $2 trillion in assets, can essentially afford to hire every lawyer and every lobbyist in Washington if they wanted to. That type of concentrated power reproduces itself. It, it, it blocks uh, fair taxation, it blocks effective financial regulation, it blocks uh, investment in public goods like infrastructure and education uh, on terms that make sense for the society. So how does that, how do you change that? Right? In the end, this is not a question of having good ideas. There, there are many good ideas that could propel the United States and other advanced societies uh, uh, in, into a new era of shared prosperity. It's not a problem of ideas. It's a problem of politics. It's a problem of organizing. It's a problem of power. Now, the economists call this political economy. If you hear an economist say the word political economy, what they're talking about is power. Right? And <clears throat> the, this problem has been faced by advanced societies before. The United States, during the New Deal in the 1930s, faced essentially the same problem and successfully dealt with it through democratic, with a small d and a big d, democratic politics. Other societies failed. Uh, that's essentially why we had World War II. Uh, the trick, though, is that you have to have politics organized, in a, have people organized, right, in a way to counteract the power of money. And you have to have, as a result of organized political power in the hands of the working majority, uh, you have to have, then have politicians who know not only how to, how to, how to uh, in, uh, have public policies that are in the public interest and are well thought out, but who are prepared to defend them, right? And who are, and who are prepared to defend them on, on terms that the public understands and can support. Right? And the, the, great, the, great, um, the great moment in American history in this matter was that, <clears throat> you know, after uh, Franklin Roosevelt won the presidency in 1933 in the midst of the Great Depression, he put in place a whole set of policies designed to turn the United States into a broad-based, pro a, a prosperous society in a broad-based way, uh, and in a modern way. So he, he policies that, for example, brought electricity to pretty much every American home, which was not true before Franklin Roosevelt was president. Policies that ensured there were paved roads and bridges leaking ev linking every part of our country. Uh, and by the way, put people to work doing these things. Right? Now, the the political power of finance was every bit as great as it is today and at that time, and those folks attacked Roosevelt with a vengeance, and they had the media behind them 
much as they do today. Right? There was no Fox News in those days, but there was the Hearst newspapers, which were every bit as powerful and every bit as vicious as Fox News. What was different, though, uh, at that time was that uh, Roosevelt and the, and the New Dealers around him and their supporters uh, in the larger society, farmers, unions, um, people from states that had been left out of the American dream, took no quarter. And the great moment of that uh, was that after one term as president, uh, Roosevelt was facing a well-financed uh, op opponent who represented financial interests. And when Roosevelt took accepted the nomination facing that well-financed opponent, he said, and I, and I quote, this is not, this is not a paraphrase, this is, these are the actual words of the President of the United States. He said, organized money hates me, and I welcome their hatred. <laughs>